Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are not yet back in our studio inside Renaissance Bank in Alpharetta, but we're hoping that'll come soon. But you know what we uh, can tell you is that the folks at Renaissance Bank have been awesome with small businesses and all the work that they're doing here around um you know, have, they've been help, so helpful with folks with PPP loans and working through that, and and uh, it's been great to see. And uh, I know some of those folks personally, uh, some of those businesses personally. So if you need a more personal experience for your banking uh, with your business, give them a call or go go uh, sit down and talk with them. The branches are not yet back open, but we expect that that will occur sometime in the near future. But until that happens, you can go uh, to renaissancebank.com, find your local office, over 200 across the South, ready to serve you, and make an appointment, and you can go uh, in to the branch. So that's the way that works. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. Renaissancebank.com is the website. Now, here's a guy I've been looking forward to for a while, uh, Mark Stiving. And he's with Impact Pricing. Mark, welcome. Hey, thanks, John. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one for obvious reasons because I love this subject. But you're the master. You've been at this for a long time. Tell people about you and how you got started in the world of pricing. Well, let's start with how I got started in the world of pricing. Uh, I remember being a kid, let's say 11, 12 years old, and going to the grocery store with my mom. And I would see prices that ended in nine. So 79, 89, whatever they were. And, and I always wondered why do companies do that? Do they think we're stupid? Right? We know 79 is the same thing as 80. So what's the big deal? So fast forward a dozen years or more, and I found myself in a doctoral program at UC Berkeley. Mm. And I was playing with scanner panel data. So this is the data that uh, companies collect when you use your loyalty cards. Mm. And we know what you bought and how much you paid and what you didn't buy. And if it was on an end dial cap or if they had an advertisement that we, we know so much. Mm -hmm. And I was able to use statistical techniques to figure out, does this nine thing really work? Mm -hmm. And it turns out it does. I mean, of course it does. Otherwise people wouldn't do it. <laughs> and so it was just fascinating. I, I became so addicted to this concept of how do people use price when they're making decisions mm. that that's pretty much what I focused on ever since then. And, and this was, I don't want to date you, Mark, but I mean, this was, <laughs> this was, really, <laughs> but I guess I just did. This was before, <laughs> this was really before uh, pricing got to be as, as uh, more of a discipline as, as it is right now. Yeah. Let's say it was in a year that started with 19. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm familiar with those years too. So I just dated okay. myself. Okay. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so let's talk about your, your, um, your firm. And I want to get into some details of, of the types of clients you work, the type of pricing, uh, that you work that you do, cause that's a bit pricing is a big subject, but talk about your firm and the kinds of clients you work with. Yeah. So, so my company, Impact Pricing, we propel companies and careers by using pricing and value as our main tools. I was an instructor for a company called Pragmatic Marketing, now called Pragmatic Institute, where I taught, I sold them a pricing course and I taught product managers for many years. And it was so fascinating and I loved it so much. Um, but they wouldn't let me create new content and I'm constantly learning and studying and wanting to create new content. So they wouldn't let me create new content unless they were going to own it. So I ended up leaving and said, I want to create a firm and its sole purpose is to educate and teach people about pricing. Mm. And that's what I do is, is I teach a lot. I do mentoring. I hold people's hands, but I'm very different than most people because I don't do consulting. Right? I don't go in and say, here's what the answer is to your problem. Mm -hmm. What I will do is I'll work with you to figure out 
how would you go about solving that problem? What's the information you need? And, and as you go solve it, I'll, I'll work with you through the whole process. But I, I don't have the time or even the desire to go solve the problems for individual companies. And, and you work mostly with B2B companies, correct? Almost exclusively with mm-hmm. B2B companies. Um, I like them for many, many reasons. Mm. Probably the single biggest reason I love B2B companies. Okay, there's two big reasons. One is almost anything you sell to another company, you should be able to put a dollar value on. Not a dollar value on what we sell, but a dollar value on the value they receive from our product. Now, it's not necessarily easy to do that, but it should be possible because if a company isn't making or saving money from what they buy from you, they're not going to buy from you. So that one's one. And then the other one, the other thing I love about B2B is there isn't this massive amount of data. In the B2C world, you have all this Amazon type data or big data and and artificial intelligence. Mm. And in B2B, so often we don't have all that data. And so we're we're using estimations and heuristics. And we have to truly understand the way our buyers think. We don't just sit back and use statistics and say, oh, if I raise my price by 5%, then this is what happens. Mm. Now, let's talk about what you mentioned there about intangibles and placing a a specific uh, dollar amount on intangibles. A lot of folks might say that's impossible to do. You said it's possible. Uh, Not only is it possible, I can't imagine selling something that I didn't do that with. (laughs) Boy, you doubled down on that one, Mark. (laughs) I love it. So why would, um, as a company, why would I buy anything if it wasn't going to help me make or save money? Mm. And and so the only question is, can we quantify that? Mm -hmm. And and the answer is there's techniques and tricks that you could use. Um, One of my, one of my newest tools I call a value table and a value table is pretty simple. Take your product, take a single feature of your product. I don't care. And uh, we're going to fill out four columns in our, pro- in our value table. Those are problem, solution, result, and value. So the solution is your product or your feature. So mm. whatever that feature is, go ahead and write that in the solutions column. And now the problem column, why'd you build that? I mean, you built that feature or that product to solve some problem in the marketplace. Mm. And it may be that there's more than one. There could be three, four, or five different problems that you built that to solve. So we'll put a problem in there. I'll put many problems in there. And then I want to go to the result page or the result column. And in the result column, make this quantifiable. Mm. What's the number? What do you expect to change? Because we, someone took our solution and applied it to their problem. So maybe you get 5% more productivity. Maybe you get 10% lower turnover. But whatever it is, there's some quantifiable number for a reason why somebody bought and used our product. And then the last step, once you have a quantifiable number in the result, using business acumen, you should be able to calculate how much money am I making or saving that customer because they're solving this problem and getting this result. And, and it's, it's not easy. I'll agree, but it's very doable for almost any product. And I'm happy to go through an example. If you want to, yeah, you want please. To any product, any feature, let's go through an example. Yeah, please. I mean, I'd love to hear an example. I mean, if you've got uh, a, a customer you've worked with, it doesn't have to be by name, of course, but somebody you've worked with client that uh, you've particularly helped in this regard, that'd be great to hear. How about instead of choosing one of my clients, let's choose a company that everybody knows. Okay. And so we'll pick LinkedIn for a second. Mm, there That's, you, you know go. That LinkedIn targets four different market segments. So we're going to pick one market segment and we'll make it the recruiter segment. Okay. So we have recruiters. Um, so they've built a product. Let's see. We've got a product feature. One of those. Oh, okay. So I'm going to change topics. Is that okay? Yeah. 
we're going to go to, we're going to go to sales navigator. Cause I actually have sales navigator. I know what it does. Okay. Okay. There you go. <laughs> that helps. <doesn't> it? <laughs> when that's that, the example, I, it helps to know what you do, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love, I, it. I love the recruiter version of LinkedIn because it's so valuable, but mm-hmm. I don't know the details of it. Okay. So let's, let's move to sales navigator. Cool. Um, in the world of sales navigator, um, what's the problem? There's mm. lots of different problems that we would use sales navigator to solve, but one of them is I can't find the prospects that would really fit my business. Mm. And so they've got this solution. They call it sales navigator. There's lots of different features, but we'll just use the whole product for now. Mm-hmm. And so what's the result? The result turns out to be um, where I used to spend, um, let's say, four hours a day trying to network and find new prospects, I can find the same number of prospects in an hour a day. So that was quantifiable. Mm, Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just saved three hours a day in prospecting. Mm. So what's the value of that? Mm. Well, I could give you the value. Let's calculate it in a couple different ways, but this is a business acumen thing. Now Mm -hmm. the easy answer is what's the value of three hours of my time? Sure. Right. Because I, I went from four hours a day to one hour a day. Mm-hmm. So I got three hours of my time times 250 days a year. There's a real dollar value in number of years. Mm. Or here's another business, another business acumen way to do that. Mark, you're still going to spend four hours a day prospecting. Now you get four times as many clients as you did, or four times as many prospects. Mm. What do you think a prospect is worth to you on average? Mm. You know, what's the probability you're going to turn a prospect into a client? Once you have a client, what's a client actually worth to you on average? And now we can do the math to say, here's the value of that product. Mm. What's amazing is we can do this with almost any product in the B2B world. That's a great example because I think what that example offers folks is there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And and some of what the way you help clients is you help open up their minds in a way to the way value gets created in ways that they really didn't think about. Oh, I think that is so true. Um, Most companies, if you go look at their webpage, you talk to their marketing people, uh, you talk to them about their, their companies, they want to tell you about their products and their features. Mm. And I got to tell you, absolutely nobody cares about your product. Well, you do, but that's it. Sure. Right. Your customers don't care about your product. (laughs) Mm. What they care about is what problems they have that you're going to solve, what results they expect to get and how much that's worth to them. Mm -hmm. So the, of the four columns, problem, solution, result, and value, we always want to talk about solution. What we should be talking about is the problems we're solving and the results we're delivering constantly. And when you can take a company and change the way they think, instead of thinking about their product, they're thinking about problems and results. Mm. Not only do they build better products, they market products better, they sell products better. And, and, and so it's, you know, I think of it as pricing the very end, let's put a dollar value on this thing. But there was so much that got us to that point that once we understand value, we are such a, a better company. We're delivering, creating, communicating, and capturing way more value than we used to. Sorry, I'm on a, I feel like I'm on a high horse here. No, but, but I, <laughs> no, no I, I love that because what you're, I, I was just sitting here thinking as I was listening to you, we've been talking now here for 15 minutes or so, and we have yet to really get into the details of pricing. I mean, because it's, it's the value creation aspect of, and helping clients understand that is, I mean, you can't help people with pricing unless you go through everything that we just talked about, I guess is maybe the way to say it. Yes. I think there are tricks and techniques that you could do to get a little bit closer to better pricing Mm -hmm. without doing everything I just talked about. But if you want to master your business, let alone pricing, you're going to do all four of those columns. Yeah. It's the difference. Well, and tricks are, they don't have a lot of calories to them, right? I mean, tricks are, are nice, I guess is what I mean, but, but they don't really create often lasting change, like helping a company walk through this, uh, value continuum and understand how to, how how that works in the minds of their customers that creates lasting change. Yes. But, but let me explain what I mean by tricks. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way at all. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, 
let's go back to my dissertation, right? My dissertation was on 99 cents, Mm -hmm. right? So why do firms end prices in nine cents? Well, they do it because it works. Mm -hmm. And so if you could teach a company what price endings to use at what points in time, they make a little bit more money and they never really understood value. Right. All they understood was how people make decisions and how we might be able to tweak those decisions and get a little bit more money. Um, we could teach uh, professional services companies or any company to offer good, better, best options mm-hmm. constantly. And I got to tell you, that's going to improve their bottom line. But if they don't truly understand value, they don't know how to create those good, better, best options in an optimal way. Mm. So, so there's lots of techniques that we can use to help companies out. But once you put value behind it, then these techniques just multiply in power. And, and then of course we get to the end of, of that process and it's all about pricing relative to that value and what's inevitable for your clients. And a lot of folks that go through this is that they realize they're generating a lot more value for their customers than they thought they were. Absolutely. There's a really interesting concept I came up with a year or so ago called the value capture gap. And it was a way for me to explain to executives that they have a pricing problem because most executives don't say that, don't think they have a pricing problem. And the question that I would always ask is um, think about how much value you're creating for your customers are you capturing your fair share of that value? Mm. And so that's what our value capture gap is. If, if we create a ton of value and we get paid very little, there's this huge gap. We should find a way to make more on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what is the, Mark, what's the characteristic of a company, a business whose prices are too low? Because you said something there that I, that resonates with me, which is a lot of companies don't think they've got a pricing problem. What if I'm a business owner? What should I be looking for to give me indications that I've got a pricing problem? I think there are some some superficial things we could look at. For example, if I am winning a high percentage of deals, I probably have a price that's too low. Mm. Um, but my, my gut, as soon as you ask the question, my gut is every company's price is too low. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. But, but, but I say that in the sense that there are probably some buyers who would be willing to pay a whole lot more for what it is that you offer. Mm. And there are some buyers who aren't willing to pay the price that you offer today or that you're asking for today. Right. And now the question becomes, can we do price segmentation? Can we find ways to find those buyers who value us more, get them to pay us more, deliver more value to them? I I think in almost every company, we have these problems because we don't think enough about price segmentation and who's willing to pay us how much. And it goes, by the way, it goes right back to that value table Mm. where you think about different types of buyers value what we do differently. And if you could find those customers or those buyers who value us a ton, now we can suddenly start tweaking our products and our offers and and how we market to those buyers. So we win more of them. When you talk about customer segmentation and, and folks, we're here with Mark Stiving. He's with impact pricing. Um, and I'm so into this conversation. See, I, I, I'm not doing my job here, <laughs> but, but um, you, do you find that, I mean, that there's a lot of resources spent on marketing and understanding customers, but do you find that there is uh, enough, I guess, data from a company that typical business that you work with in terms of being able to segment customer segment effectively? So the question becomes, do we do segmentation based on data or can we do segmentation based on uh, gut feel, talking to enough of our customers? Mm. In the B2C world, we definitely have tons and tons of data. Right. But now the question becomes, are we using it intelligently? Are we thinking through the processes? And I would argue that uh, in the B2C world, they have so much data 
that they forget to think about value. When mm. they do market segmentation, they do it statistically, but that misses a lot of the power of understanding how our buyers are valuing our products and what they value in our products. Mm. In the B2B world, we don't have that much data. We have much less data, I'll put it that way, but we still might have thousands of customers or just hundreds of customers. Even in that respect, when we start doing value tables, when we start thinking about how different customers value our products differently, segmentation is just going to pop out at you. Mm. It isn't, we don't need hundreds of thousands of data points to make this work. We can do this with, you know, once you've talked to a dozen customers, you probably have a really good feel for which customers and what the customers are like who are willing to pay you more. Mm -hmm. What are the problems they have? How do they value those? Mm. You don't need hundreds or thousands of these. You actually need the, the willingness to go listen to your marketplace. That's what you need. Mm. And that requires, uh, I guess the, the point I'm trying to get to, and I didn't ask the question very well, but the point I'm trying to get to is it seems like a lot of companies aren't really effectively set up for that in spite of the fact they've got a lot of resources devoted towards sales, devoted toward marketing, they're really not equipped to have a great, what you and I would call a value conversation with clients. Is that I, what I you find? Absolutely spot on. Okay. okay. Absolutely spot on. And, and let's take that value conversation, uh, conversation just a little <laughs> bit deeper. Right. We expect our salespeople to be able to have value conversations. Mm. And I think about this, I think of them as so powerful because any given customer or buyer doesn't know how much value they're going to be able to get from our product. But on the other hand, we don't know how much value we're going to be able to deliver to any individual customer. Mm -hmm. If we want to figure that that amount of value out, it takes a conversation between our salespeople and the customer. So we call that a value conversation. Let's go figure this out. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you say, I want my marketing people to have value conversations and I want my product managers to have value conversations. Now what we're doing is we're getting the people who are going to go out and do marketing or go out and build the new features to truly understand what does value mean in our marketplace. And we do enough of those value conversations and we've got a great feel for market segmentation, for price segmentation. This is not rocket science. But what it is, is it's hard, scary work that people don't want to go do. Mm. In spite of the payback. In spite of the payback. Because no one's telling you to do it. Nobody's telling a product manager, you have to go do value conversations in your marketplace. Mm. Instead, they sit in their cubicle and and listen to um, feedback that comes in from their current customers that says, hey, I need this new feature. And that's what they go do. You know, it's interesting you, you put it that way. This is akin to something along the lines of an investment managers. They don't get penalized for the profits that they don't realize because of things they don't buy. Right. I mean, they they don't get penalized for that. Right. I mean, and that's what, that's what we're talking about. Right. That's absolutely right. The Mm -hmm. question is, do you want to build a great, fast growing, super successful company? Mm. And by the way, that takes work and that takes risk. Mm. Or do you want to keep plodding along at your two to 10% growth and you're happy and you don't get fired and life is really good. Mm. And it is a continual process. And in terms of, because value changes. So let's get into pricing in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> so all the rules have changed, right? I mean, we, in a pandemic, uh, we, we can't raise our prices anymore, right? Okay, so here's what I love about this uh, pandemic situation. Yeah. Is none of the rules have changed. Pricing theory is still pricing theory. People still are making decisions based on uh, what's what they think is best for themselves, what do they think is most valuable. So all the theory is the same. The only things that have changed is everything else. It, sure. Our customers are buying differently. Our markets are different. Our competitors are behaving differently. It's like, it's like we got this sudden shock in our marketplace that we're all scrambling to try to figure out how do we handle this shock mm. because it's different for different companies. Mm-hmm. Some companies, if you're an airline, your business just dropped off or a cruise line 
right? Your business just dropped off a cliff and how do you survive this? And what are you going to do? On the other hand, if you're Zoom, your business is skyrocketing right now <laughs> and, and life is amazing. So what are you going to do with that situation? What, what just happened is in most of our markets, most of our businesses, we would traditionally have pretty slow changes, even in fast changing marketplaces, they're pretty slow changes. Mm -hmm. And we just had a single event that took everybody's market and said, you, it just changed. Now go figure it out. Yeah. I mean, it was a value scramble, right? I mean, all the values changed, customer values changed and it was a complete scramble. Absolutely. So everybody is trying to figure out how is my market different? How are my buyers making different decisions? And, and in a lot of cases, we still don't even know the answers to those questions. Yeah. So, so how do you, how do you counsel companies to situate themselves internally uh, when it comes to understanding values that customers have, that their customers have, uh, uh, keeping up with the changes and pricing effectively. How do you counsel them to do that? If I could change companies in one way, it would be to create a culture of value. I call that a value-based business. Hmm. And the idea being everybody in the company everybody in product management and marketing and sales in the executive uh, room, everybody should be asking what's the value of everything we're doing. And they, and they should be able to come up with some kind of reasonable answer based in true value theory. Can I teach your listeners one quick value lesson? Please. This is probably the single most important value thing I, I ever learned or figured out or however you want to look at that. Most buyers make two different decisions when they buy something. The first decision they make is, will I? Will I buy something in this product category? Mm. And then after they've said, yes, I'm going to buy something in the product category, then they usually go on and say, okay, which one am I going to go buy? So are you in the market for a new car? No, who cares? Yes, okay, which new car are you going to go buy? And you go shop for a bunch of new cars. Sometimes buyers only make a will I decision and then they buy mm. and there is no competitive alternative considered. So this is because we have products that are like that. It could be that we're in a situation that's like that, but what's so important is when people are making just a will I decision and not comparing our products to competition, they're not price sensitive and their value is the value of solving the problems that we solve. When they go on to compare us to a competitive alternative, they become very price sensitive. Mm -hmm. And the value is our value relative to the competitive alternative. That distinction was worth thousands of dollars of, <laughs> of, of, or more of revenue to those that listen and take advantage of that. That was awesome. I got to say, it's one of the most powerful concepts. It, in my mind, understanding how our buyers value our products mm -hmm. is the single most important thing we could do as a business. Mm. Wow. Great words here from uh, Mark Stiving. He's with Impact Pricing. So, um, Mark, let's talk about how you, you mentioned it a little earlier about, uh, you know, the how you work with companies, but let's talk about, you know, the kinds of clients that are good fits for you and your firm. I have two different types of clients that I typically deal with. Um, we have a, a lot of mentoring programs, several mentoring programs we do. And these clients are typically, let's say 50 million to $500 million in revenue. What usually happens is these are companies where if you can impact the pricing well, it has a really big impact, so multi-million dollar impact on the bottom line. And so my fees that way seem pretty small relative to the return. And yet once you get over 500 million, oftentimes people have their own pricing departments and so they don't see the value in bringing in someone outside. Mm -hmm. So that 50 to 500 million is a pretty good range for my type of client. Gotcha. The other type of client I often help is individuals. Mm. And I help individuals 
Uh, these could be product managers. They could be pricing professionals in big companies. And I do that through an online school I have called Champions of Value at championsofvalue.com. Mm -hmm. I put up uh, courses and probably the most valuable thing I do is I offer a weekly office hours to all my students. Mm. So we just sit and talk about pricing and whatever pricing issues they have, or it doesn't matter, but there's a, a today there's five courses up there and I add a new course probably every other month to that education program. Now, and you're a podcaster. So talk about, let's get that out there about how folks can find your podcast. My podcast is called Impact Pricing and in any Spotify, iTunes, any of those places, you'll be able to find impact pricing. I got to say, it's, that's probably the sing, my single favorite thing to do in all the things I do because I get to talk to, I get to talk to people and try to learn things I don't already know, which is just so fascinating because there's so much to learn. Mm, sure. For sure. And you, uh, one of the themes that you've had in, in a lot of the recent, uh, educational material you've put out, whether it's podcast or, or, or post or what have you is uh, subscription pricing. I, I want to make sure we get to that before we have to go, but what talk a little bit about, first of all, what that is, because there's some folks that may not know what that is. Talk about what that is and uh, the impact that that can have on a, on a business. Yeah, I think subscriptions are fascinating. Uh, back when I was teaching pricing for pragmatic marketing, I would often get the question, do these concepts apply to subscriptions? And my answer was yes, because it's always about how do our buyers value our products. Mm. And then after I left Pragmatic, I, I jumped into really study subscriptions because it was such a popular concept nowadays. We sell mm. so many things in subscriptions. And as I studied it, it, yeah, it's true. We still price it the same way, but there's so many nuances that are fascinating. Mm. Because in traditional business, let's say that you want to, you're a consultant, you want to go land a deal. So, so what you care about is winning that deal. And now we've won the deal, we go deliver it, life was really good. In subscriptions, you have to care about winning the deal. You have to care about keeping the customer happy so they keep paying you. And if you're really good, you start to care about how do you get them to grow with you and pay you more money over time. So instead of this one revenue bucket, which is I need to go win a deal, we're actually managing three different revenue buckets and subscriptions. Mm -hmm. I need to win deals, keep deals, and grow customers. So it's it's fascinating that, that they have to think about things differently. And that's one of the many things I love about subscriptions. And what, I mean, this is a whole nother show which we may schedule <laughs> soon. Uh, so stand by folks. Uh, uh, we may have uh, Mark diving part two here pretty soon, but what, uh, give the quick overview, if you would, if you would to a business that's thinking about subscription pricing and what, what are the kind of aspects of this that they need to think about um, before they make the dive? I hear a lot of companies say, hey, we're going to go subscription. And oftentimes that's driven by the CFO. The CFO says we're going to go subscription. And the reason is that you get phenomenal returns from the, from the marketplace, from the stock market, from your investors, if you've got a successful subscription company. Many, many uh, higher multiples of revenue that way. The problem is you have to go subscriptions for the right reason. Mm -hmm. It isn't because you want to go subscriptions. It's because your buyers want to buy your products that way. And the way to think about it is, are you delivering constant benefits, periodic benefits to your customers? And if you can set your business up so that you're constantly delivering these benefits to your customers, then it makes sense to figure out a way to turn your business into a subscription. But if you're not doing that, if you're selling a product and think, hey, I'd really like to make that a subscription instead of selling the product, it probably doesn't make sense. And your buyers probably don't want to go that way. And that's really something important for smaller professional services firms to think about because, you know, as you say, the CFO inside of them reads from the bottom line up and <laughs> sees results and they don't think about 
if you sign on to this, you're going to have to deliver, make sure you're delivering a lot of value uh, consistently over a period of time. That's absolutely right. Um, I mentioned that I have the, the champions of value.com website. I also offer a subscription there. Mm. So as opposed to coming in and buying courses, you just pay a monthly fee. Now it's up to me to make sure I'm delivering value mm. every single month to my customers, because if I'm not, they end up leaving. And that was a lost opportunity for me. Sure. You've got a book coming out on subscription, uh, subscription pricing. So let's uh, get that out there for folks to uh, be on the lookout for. Yeah, we do have a new book coming out. I haven't finalized the title yet. Uh, any ideas, I'm welcome to hear. Okay. But here's a couple of titles that we're looking at. One of my favorites I heard, uh, Subscriptions, It's Not Your Grandfather's Business Model. Mm, okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, How about so Subscribe to Profits? Say that one more time. Subscribe to Profits. Oh, I love that. I, I got to write that down. Hang on. Subscribe okay. to profits. <laughs> I'll send you the podcast link. How about that? <laughs> okay. <that'll work. laughs> okay. No, this is good. No, th- uh, seriously though. You, w- when do you think you'll have the book out? So we, we, people can put it on their calendar. Um, I would say we're probably six months out from having it available. Okay. Okay. But in the meantime, you've got a lot of stuff out there. Cause I know I've listened to it. You've got some great podcasts. Uh, uh, content and other content that you've put out with impact pricing on subscription pricing. So folks check that out. Uh, but let's get specific there. Uh, Mark, as we close, uh, tell people how they can connect with some of these resources that you offer and, and be in touch with you if they'd like to do that. Yeah, there's uh, several different ways. I'm on LinkedIn, Mark Stiving. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have at the championsofvalue.com site, we have a free community. You can go there and we publish everything that I publish. Uh, there are links that are on championsofvalue.com. So you can get that uh, there as well. And you can always feel free to email me questions or, or uh, thoughts. And my email address is mark at impactpricing.com. And finally, at the impactpricing.com website, we have all of the blogs posted there. Great stuff from Mark Stiving. He's with Impact Pricing. Mark, this has been great. Really appreciate you coming on. John, I've had so much fun. Sorry I talk so fast. <laughs> well, well, for, for, well, fortunately, I think faster than my accent would reveal. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, folks, just a quick reminder that you can find this show on all the major podcast apps. That would be Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify. Yep, we're on all of them. We're also at NorthFultonBusinessRadio.com. You can find our archive of shows there. We're working on the next 250 because we just passed number 250. Um, but we would really appreciate it if you would go on your favorite podcast app and give us a great review because it helps folks find this show and find the great business leaders like Mark who um, – deserve to be found based on the great work that they do. So um, please support us in that way. We we would really appreciate it. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at North Fulton BRX. So for my guest, Mark Stiving, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.